Hey guys, my guest for today is somebody I hugely look up to. I am talking about nobody else than Jefferson Osai from Daily Paper. Welcome, Jefferson. Good afternoon. <laughs> nice apartment. Actually. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Because yes, yes. you were actually supposed to be in New York. Yes, uh, we were about to open up our very first flagship store outside of our home country, the Netherlands. Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, due to the whole pandemic situation, uh, yeah, things have been delayed, mm -hmm. postponed. So yeah. Uh, you are here now. Uh, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about that. Yes. But before we start, I have these cards. These are the stories of young cards. And we created these cards to start conversations. I selected two questions for you because I know you like to sneak sometimes. <laughs> so these are the two questions that I have. I personally selected these because I would love to know your answer. So pick the card, read the question out loud and answer. We'll start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> what perception do you think people have of you and how do you deal with it? Hmm. Um, uh, people think I'm very reserved, uh, hard to reach. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes people think I'm arrogant. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I deal with that? Uh, more or less, um, I, f I filter for myself. So um, I'm very careful with how I spend my energy. So like when it comes to you, I know you for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So I know how to use my energy uh, towards you. But if I meet someone new, I like to uh, reserve myself, observe uh, the other person. And from there on, I'll choose when and how to interact. So sometimes people might think, like, ah, he doesn't like me or whatever. But that's me uh, making sure I'm, I'm, I'm using my energies in the, in the right way. Yeah. And I think that's something that I've learned from you now because, like you said, we've known each other for years. I can't even remember where we know each other from. Was it like our school days? Be same plane? I don't no, know. That's I what I... No, no, no. It's way early. Oh. Uh, I think the MZM Southeast community, mm -hmm. um, especially the Ghanaian community, obviously. Uh, I don't know, did you used to go to the Kandelaar, the church? Nay, no, I didn't. I used to go to a certain <laughs> church. Probably the African church. I don't know, yeah, but I've we've known each other for a long and I really like what you just said because in the beginning I was always like, ah, Jefferson, he's so reserved, but then you explained to me why mm -hmm. and I really respect that. So, yeah. yes, people might see you like that, but there's a reason for that and yeah, that's yeah. something that um, I could definitely learn a lot from. Okay. Next okay. question. If you could only eat one food from one culture for the rest of time, which would you choose? It's very easy. <laughs> which one? Yeah, the Ghanaian culture, obviously. Um, <laughs> A wet dish fufu? No. <laughs> um, I love kelowele. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Nice. It's very easy. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, Jefferson, we were both in Ghana in December. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us more about the experience and why did Daily Paper want to uh, open a pop-up store in Ghana? Uh, first and foremost, um, Daily Paper is inspired by uh, our African heritage. So I founded the brand together with Hussein Suleiman. He has Somali origins and Abdurrahman Trapsini. He has Moroccan origins. And ever since uh, we started the brand, we felt that uh, our background was not well represented in the fashion realm industry. So we wanted to make a change. Uh, so from there on, we started to build a whole narrative around our platform. Because at, when we started, uh, the brand was a blog. We were writing uh, stories about us as, as a collective. We were traveling around the world, uh, hosting exhibitions, uh, events, uh, going to uh, fashion uh, parties, uh, fashion weeks. Mm -hmm. And we were covering that on the blog. So from there on, we wanted to promote the blog, start printing t-shirts, selling it to family and friends. All of a sudden, it became uh, something big, so we stopped blogging because, yeah, blogging was in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was a way to start. It was a way to start, mm -hmm. but if you look at the current times, 
people are vlogging now. Yeah. And at, at that time it was blogging. Yeah. So there were so many blogs. And so there was a def different definition of blogging yeah. than yeah. what people think now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we felt that we had to make a change to our platform. So we decided to start uh, expanding to clothing. And when we started, we, as I already mentioned, we felt there was a certain gap missing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you already had the folklore brands that really okay. represented the heritage of uh, African cultures and African countries. But we felt that it wasn't translated uh, towards uh, a more Western narrative, a more accessible narrative, so that uh, someone in Venlo or in deep ends of Germany mm -hmm. can uh, wear something uh, culturally African related yeah. and uh, support a certain story. So we felt that we had to build a bridge uh, with our brand and fast forward, uh, yeah, we've opened up uh, two stores in Amsterdam. Uh, the brand is sold in uh, 29 countries in approximately 200 multi-brand stores around Sick. the world. And we always feel that the story that we are trying to ch tell hasn't been told everywhere. Yeah. So how we, <clears throat> we, we do try to tell the story is to uh, being present in a certain market mm -hmm. by uh, hosting uh, pop-up stores. So we've done pop-up stores in Berlin, we've done in London, we've done several in, in Paris, uh, with our showroom obviously during Fashion Week, and in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, and um, South Africa was actually the very first on African soil. Yeah, I can remember that. Yeah, and that, that we've been doing that uh, for four years now, and we felt like, okay, it's time to make the step to either East Africa, North Africa, or West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so we sat down, the three of us, and we felt like, okay, what is logistically and operationally uh, doable? Yeah. Uh, as you all may know, the situation in Somalia is somewhat unstable, so therefore uh, also not safe. Yeah. Um, and uh, with a previous project that we did in, in Ghana with Puma, uh, where we made a football pitch mm -hmm. for African Girls School. We, uh, not, not per se me, but my companions, Abdurrahman and Hussein, they were convinced after that, their first time visit in Ghana that we had to do it yeah. in Ghana. So I, so I didn't even have to say like, yo guys, we're gonna do it in Ghana. Mm -hmm. They were like, nah, let's do it in Ghana. That's don't, nice. Don't even think about Somalia or Morocco. <clears throat> because so do you notice any cultural differences between the three of you? Because you guys, the three of you come from Africa, but different mm. parts of Africa. Yeah, obviously. So do you notice any cultural differences? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, Abdurrahman and, and Hussein uh, are Muslims. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I also believe in God, but I was raised in a Christian way. Mm -hmm. But there are obviously, uh, yeah, same rules apply yeah. in terms of religion. So we always find common grounds. And uh, I fast during Ramadan. So okay. uh, I grew up with Abdurrahman mm -hmm. and lots of different uh, 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 Muslim people in different uh, communities. So also Ghanaian uh, Muslims, Nigerian Muslims, but also Moroccan, Turkish. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot from their culture. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I understand them and they understand me. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously uh, the three of us have been raised by the street more or less. So that's how we uh, understand each other at all times. And what I love about you as well is that what I noticed early on is every time when you greet somebody, you greet them in their language. <laughs> and I think we spoke about it before, or I don't know, but I noticed it. And that's how you really respect other people, their cultures. Yeah. And, um, but you're also very invested in your own Ghanaian roots. Yeah. You were born in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, you've been calling yourself Papagana for yeah. years. Yeah. Why? Like, where did this come from? Okay, yeah. Can I finish the previous story? Yeah, please, you can. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you can. So, yeah. That's why we started the, the pop-up store okay. in, in Ghana. Yeah. And um, uh, ever since we started uh, Daily Paper, people have been perceiving the brand as African-based. Mm. So after the pop-up store in South Africa, we really felt that now is the time to do something in West Africa. Yeah. To give back to the people. And what happened there is, it was obviously during the year of return, 
there was a lot of media attention towards uh, this whole uh, period and um, yeah we gave something uh, to the people so our products were not like priced as they are here. yeah uh, they were way cheaper uh, people could access our uh, daily paper universe have a chat with us uh, visit events panels parties mm -hmm. And obviously, I went to many of the events. Yeah. Um, also, the year of return was definitely a huge mm -hmm. thing. I think mm -hmm. it was very smart what you guys did. Uh, also, because a lot of people, some of the people did not know about Daily Paper. Mm -hmm. A lot of people wanted to be part of Daily Paper for years. Mm -hmm. And you guys created that platform mm -hmm. with talks, etc. Um, but again, I do want to know, um, where did this name Papagana come from? Yeah. So... Uh, just to break it down for you, uh, the Papa doesn't mean father. Okay. It means uh, someone great from Ghana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, I don't know if you guys know Papa Wembe. Yeah. Yeah, so he's a uh, greatness from, mm. uh, uh, from Congo. And that's what it means. And it's an oath to an uh, uh, illegal taxi driver, a snodder, how they call it here. In yeah. <laughs> And um, he uh, is, a, is, a, is a person that always took care of people, especially the Ghanaian community, by uh, offering them free rides. Uh, also, uh, yeah, relating with them on a personal level. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's actually a, a myth from uh, the, the, the Ghanaian culture in Amsterdam. So I felt like I should uh, give him an oath. More or less. I did not know this story, so that's really cool. And that was also your kind of DJ name, right? Back in the days? Or yeah, my artist name. Your artist, artist. name. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. do you still play? Yeah, the I can play, but uh, yeah, it's time to pass the torch uh, to the young kids. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. okay. Well, you guys, like I said in the beginning, have been reclaiming the narrative of Africa for a very long time now. And I'm saying reclaiming instead of changing the narrative, because with Daily Paper, you've really been pushing what's already there in Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, what has been the change so far in the Netherlands since you started Daily Paper? Yeah, I don't want, I don't want to say that we're reclaiming. I think we're changing a certain perception, mm. a certain narrative. Obviously, in, when you grow up in a Western civilization, or, um, the, um, the, the public view on Africa and on of African cultures is always uh, stigmatized. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see the the OSCOM advertising or the charity advertising. You'll only see poverty. Yeah. And we felt like, yeah, it's nice that you guys do that. But there's also a different side of Africa people should know mm -hmm. about and see. Um, so like, for example, there's also a skate culture yeah. in Ghana or in East Africa. There's mm -hmm. also a graffiti culture. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a streetwear culture. All these things are all present, but people don't get to see that mm -hmm. because they feel or they think that that doesn't exist. So uh, when started Daily Paper, we felt that we had to uh, incorporate that in our DNA, in our ethos, yeah. in our aesthetic, in everything that we do. Do you feel like that people in the Netherlands or all over the world, because of Daily Paper, have that the narrative of that, the perception of Africa has changed? Because mm -hmm. the interesting thing is we were both born here, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, you go to Ghana. I don't know if you used to go to Ghana with your parents. I used to go to Ghana back in the days with my parents. Yeah. I wouldn't really see the club scene. Mm -hmm. It was until I was at the age of maybe somewhere 20 years mm -hmm. old. I mm -hmm. can't remember that I used that I went to Ghana with my friends mm -hmm. and my sisters and really got to see Ghana for myself. Mm -hmm. So have you noticed that because of Daily Paper, the people over here um, have that you guys have really changed the perception as well? I wouldn't say it's because of Daily Paper. I think it's, uh, it's a certain timeline. So I would say after the World Cup in South Africa, um, uh, African culture became more accessible mm -hmm. for the Western civilization. And obviously we started uh, the brand based on that maybe four or five years before that. But it really contributed yeah. to people getting to know uh, about uh, different countries and the cultures within Africa. Mm -hmm. So uh, the music part also played a huge role in the whole uh, perception that people have of Africa. Yeah. So if you have like artists like Wizkid, uh, like Burna Boy. You, which you also have collaborated with, right? Yeah, all those artists coming out, out of uh, different parts of Africa. 
and they all contribute to the to the whole bigger story that well, you and I are talking about. Yeah. So it's a perfect time where yeah. actually everybody, yeah, everybody all over the world yeah. felt that need. Yeah, and also um, if you look at, for example, um, yeah, back in the day in in, in the Netherlands, uh, some Ghanaians were afraid to mention that they were from Ghana. Yeah. Have uh, you had that also? No. Okay. Uh, Me neither. People always used to call Ghanaians or people from Africa Boku. Boku. Mm -hmm. And that was more or less from the, uh, the Surinamese community. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, they felt that they were somewhat better than Africans. Uh, but I always reminded them that you're, we are from the same continent. Exactly. So don't let, don't let people tell you something else. Which is so interesting because I was just talking to a friend that is from Suriname mm. about the differences. And mm -hmm. she was like, yeah, but um, she's from the diaspora and mm -hmm. she sees that we are very connected with Africa. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, but we are from the diaspora as well. Mm -hmm. The thing is, when Ghanaians came to the Netherlands, mm -hmm. they actually wanted to connect with the Surinamese people, but mm -hmm. they were like, no, you guys are Bokus, we're not mm -hmm. Africans. Yeah, yeah. And then now, yeah. kind of being an African is cool yeah. all over the world, so mm -hmm. everybody wants to claim mm -hmm. that part. Yeah. So. Yeah, and obviously uh, in the Surinamese history, uh, yeah, uh, the Dutch colonized them. Mm -hmm. So they played a huge uh, part in I say that, uh, yeah, mentally yeah. Er erasing the identity. Mm -hmm. So uh, some Surinamese uh, people, yeah, sometimes don't really want to identify themselves as African. But luckily enough, that is changing. Yeah, so we're but slowly but surely. I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, and uh, you and I, we come from a time yeah. that this wasn't uh, cool. Cool. It's true. And this is the same for, for London, for example, where mm -hmm. the Jamaicans were doing that towards the Nigerians yeah. and the Ghanaians. Yeah. Same story. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is something that is, 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 has, has occurred all over the world, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. No, and um, but that's that's exactly what I was saying in the beginning. Like you are playing a huge part of this whole movement. Um, a lot of people look up to you, and I always tell you, I want to be like Daily Paper with my agency. And then you always shake your head, and you're like, No, you're gonna be your own. But what I'm trying to say is just like. I don't know if you are, obviously you know, but you guys, what you have done for the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, um, for Africans over here, is so important. And what I also like is when you came to the office and we were with Faye, um, that also works for you guys, she was mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to do a panel talk and you're going to be in a panel. You're like, no, I don't want to be in a panel anymore. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give young people that are like, I want to be like Daily Paper or that just look up to what you do? Yeah, the first and foremost, you always have to stay true to yourself, your authentic self. And from there on, uh, your own Daily Paper will come to life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I got to say, more or less. Um, and the biggest thing is to always think big, yeah. but start small. Mm -hmm. yeah. And okay, when you say think big, start small, what do you mean? So always dream big, mm -hmm. but always humble yourself. So okay. um, just to give you an example, our very first collections were made out of five t-shirt styles. Yeah. Uh, but those five t-shirt styles uh, represented all corners of African culture. Mm -hmm. uh, all these stories were captured in five t-shirts. Um, and that was already strong enough to spread a certain message. But, but what would you say to young kids that have no idea of starting a, a brand at all? Because mm -hmm. you're saying you started with five t-shirts mm -hmm. that represented mm -hmm. all parts of mm -hmm. Africa which you wanted mm -hmm. to represent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you guys came about that idea? Did you guys brainstorm together? Like mm -hmm. For somebody that has no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is for us that, uh, like I said, we, 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 looked in, we looked into ourselves and we felt that um, within the fashion industry, something was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, it didn't come just like that. Yeah. We were orientating between 2010 and 2012. Mm. So uh, at that time, it was kind of kind of very easy to jump on a, on a trend. So would you say in the two years you guys were testing and making samples or were you already selling like between 2010 and yeah, we were, we, were, we were making samples, mm -hmm. we were uh, also still promoting the blog and at that time uh, there was a period where uh, a lot of like, uh, uh, I like to say, uh, hipster gothic black brands came, mm -hmm. so like very dark, like Rick Owens, uh, streetwear brands that were like 
all black everything. Yeah, and I at remember that time those it was days. very easy to jump on that trend. Yeah. So that was an, that was a possibility for mm -hmm. us, but we chose the hard route because that we we felt that that could create like a certain uh, uh, long term thingy. Yeah. And um, yeah, with that said, that's how we we started to build with that idea. Like, okay, uh, there's so much more to tell about certain cultures. Mm -hmm. Why why don't we translate that into clothing? Yeah, and talking about building, mm. um, this summer I came to the office and we were talking about building a legacy. We had a really interesting conversation and also about how, um, you know, us having this platform, how we really want to help the next generation, mm. young people of color. Mm. Um, how do you guys at Daily Paper make sure that um, it's still diverse at the, at, on like the workplaces? Yeah, like um, it's very important for us that um, that all types of cultures are represented in our office. Um, yeah, if you look at the, the Dutch government, they always say the multicultural society has mm -hmm. failed. Mm. And I'm like, Yo, you guys, you shut up, come into my <laughs> office, yeah, and then you can see Literally. for yourself. Yeah, you know, true. And uh, I think that's how you should uh, uh, be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. uh, in 2020. Um, when you come to our office, you don't see someone in, in, in a full tuxedo or suit. Yeah. You don't even know who's the boss. Mm -hmm. uh, our average age is, t is 26 at the office. Yeah. So uh, that's the thing that we have. There's a certain um, way of, of uh, certain energy that's at our office that's completely different. And that's, that has been created by being uh, uh, yeah, inclusive towards all types of uh, cultures. And has that always been like that from the beginning when you guys would like put out um, a job application? Would black people or young colored people also apply for the job? Or When we started, we were still a very small brand. So yeah. people would come up to us very easily. So one of those uh, people is, uh, is Nathan, uh, Nathan Badu. Um, he started as a, as a finance intern. Mm. He was basically uh, yeah, doing our bookkeeping. And, I remember uh, you guys were in London a long time ago yeah. and you told me, oh, Ash, come over, man, London fashion. Yeah, London week. collection. Yeah, 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 with Nathan as well, yeah. But, yeah, that was long before, but like, um, he started out as an intern and now he's a, a manager. And wow. He, he just turned 20, 25. Sick. So, um, yeah, we've always had this mentorship type of uh, DNA within us because nobody held our hands mm -hmm. when Daily Paper was... Uh, uh, started. So mm -hmm. we felt like, okay, um, there are some young Husseins, some young Abdurrahmans, yeah. some young Jeffersons who also have a certain idea or a certain dream that they want to uh, pursue. So why not help them? Why uh, not open up our doors mm -hmm. and um, uh, function as a platform? Because there are so many talents that have past our office spaces and are now working for bigger companies or yeah. have started their own platform or own, uh, yeah, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and I, like, I like that idea. Yeah. So, like, it's not as if we want to keep everything for ourselves mm -hmm. and we don't want to share, share and cake. Yeah. Because, like I said, we are built on uh, inclusion, not exclusion. Yeah. Some, some brands, some initiatives have been successful along the way mm -hmm. by being very exclusive yeah but uh, we felt it's time to change that it's by making the doors open mm -hmm. and you mentioned before of in the beginning of this conversation um, uh, that you guys are opening a store in new york yeah you were actually supposed to be in new york yeah um i'm happy you're here can you tell me more about the store in new york um the store in new york uh for we had this idea for more than two years now. Cause like um, after the, we opened up the Amsterdam store, we immediately knew like, okay, the physical experience that we have created in Amsterdam is, can function as the blueprint for the rest of the world. So why not try overseas? So um, we initially we wanted to open up in London, mm -hmm. but London is compared to New York, way more expensive. Yeah. So uh, we felt like, okay, looking at also looking at the current tendance in, in, uh, in America, um, if you look at um, uh, the people of color out there, they're really looking into like, okay, 
where do I come from as a human mm -hmm. being? Uh, with the whole ancestry.com. Yeah. And that really ties into the daily paper story. Yeah. Uh, so we felt like, okay, this is the right time to uh, initiate something in the US. Mm -hmm. And our story is um, um, best uh, interpreted if we are there physically. Yeah. And um, yeah, the store is gonna be in the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. The Lower East Side is, uh, is you can kind of compare it to um, uh, Amsterdam East uh, or Old West. Okay. Um, yeah, it's like a it's like a community driven area. Mm -hmm. So a lot of lots of sports activities are there. Uh, the youth culture is very present there. Um, and it's, it's not a bougie location. And who makes those decisions? When you guys say, okay, we want to take the next step to go to New York, is, are the three of you guys brainstorming together and like, okay, let's go to New York. Do you have an extended team? No, it's always the three of us. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, uh, Hussein, uh, he's like the dreamer. Uh, and uh, Abdurrahman is also the dreamer. And I'm in between. Okay. Um, the realistic one and the most grounded one. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always come to a mutual understanding when it comes to certain decisions that are, that are, that are being made. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Hussein always wanted to live in New York mm. uh, based off his love for hip hop. Um, he always wanted to uh, initiate something in New York, do something in New York. Um, so after we did a pop up store in London, we felt yeah. like, okay, let's start. Uh, looking for space in London, but that was too expensive for us. Yeah. And then we felt like, okay, which other um, city resembles uh, Amsterdam the most? And that's New York. New York, yeah, dope. Uh, as maybe you all know, like Amsterdam, uh, New York used to be called New Amsterdam. Yeah, true. Um, obviously, it's way bigger than Amsterdam now, mm -hmm. but in terms of diversity, and the way the city is condensed, it really resembles Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, and um, um, yeah, so we decided like, okay, um, we're gonna uh, split up, divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. So Hussein uh, went to uh, live in New York for nine months. Um, and um, he more or less uh, did the field research because before uh, he was living there, we already had a huge community out there mm -hmm. of international friends that we got to know along the way um, from, yeah, from uh, creatives to athletes to all types of people that work within the creative industry. And when he was there, he did the field research. So through the boroughs of New York, he stayed a few uh, months in Brooklyn, he stayed in uh, Harlem, mm -hmm. he stayed in, in, in Soho, he stayed in all different places. And when he stayed in Lower East Side, he felt like, yo guys, this is it. This is it. But in those nine months, I obviously went back and forth. Yeah. Abdurrahman went back and forth. So we could share those experiences together. Mm. Obviously, we didn't live there like Hussein. Yeah. Because uh, the motor was neat, still, the engine was still active on the other side yeah, of the world. Yeah. And obviously, uh, when you are one of the founders, you immediately uh, a board member, or CEO. So uh, certain decisions out, out here are still crucial yeah. to be made. Yeah. So that's why we divided. And uh, from there on, um, uh, yeah, we went back and forth to get a little taste of the city. I stayed there uh, a few weeks. Then I went back, Abdurrahman came, and then we found a building. And uh, yeah, the building was, had been empty for more than uh, eight, nine years. Wow. So it was kind of a similar story as uh, how we discovered our, uh, uh, of it, of, no, our store space here in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Also a very empty building. And um, yeah, from there on, we were like, okay, let's start negotiating with a landlord and see what's doable and what's realistic. And yeah. after all these experiences, mm -hmm. what is the biggest lesson you've learned from Daily Paper? Um, more or less our colleagues. That's the hardest thing to manage. Because uh, as an entrepreneur, as a creative entrepreneur, 
we are always looking to what's next no. and how fast can we achieve a certain goal. So entrepreneuring is not, not difficult, but it's the people that, that are your colleagues. Yeah. But you, do you also mean building a team? Yeah, building a team, but also maintaining a team. Yeah. Keeping that team energized, keeping that team motivated. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, they're not robots. They're humans. Yeah. They're, they have emotions. So some of them, they work for the brand as if it's their own brand. Mm -hmm. Some of them always need a shoulder pad, like, oh, yeah. you're doing a good job. Some of them are, are smiling in, in your face, but they're dealing with something yeah. that they don't want to tell you. Yeah. And then you have people that take advantage of certain situations. How do you deal with that? Because I recently um, launched Young the Agency mm -hmm. and I'm also working on building a team. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had a few people I've worked with and it was just like, mm, nah, this is not what it is. Or um, they probably do not understand my vision. Um, so it's quite hard for me as a startup to find the right team. Do you mm -hmm. guys... Um, look for a team yourself do you have an hr department because what i liked about um uh, Faye when you guys came to the office is that she was like she knew hussein mm -hmm. and he was like come and work for us mm -hmm. so everything you guys do is very organic mm -hmm. um obviously now you guys have stores mm -hmm. you have two stores in amsterdam mm -hmm. yeah. right mm -hmm. um so how many people are working for you now so it's around 60 people so right. how do you, did you how do you make sure that all sixty of them understand the vision of Daily Paper just the way the three of you understand it? So we're staying connected with them, so it's with all like, of them. So more like a family type of yeah. situation. So I see my colleagues as extended family. Every day when I walk in walk into the office, I always say hello to the people, talk with them, have a little you know chit chat, mm -hmm. so that the connection always stays. Yeah. Uh, this is for me very normal. Some some people might say like, oh, the big boss is saying hello to me. <laughs> but for me, that's the way I've been raised. Yeah. It's very normal to Respectful. say hello to yeah. people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's certain little things that we do yeah. to maintain a certain relationship with our team. Yeah. So, for example, um, yeah, um, I, I like uh, a lot of our team members love football, for example. So if uh, some of us can arrange tickets, I gave it to my to my colleagues. Dope. Certain things like that. You yeah. Know, like uh, just treat them as friends, yeah. but it's still very yeah. professional. Yeah, professional. So it's like a thin layer, but yeah. it's always it's always clear. Like okay, this is the time to be friends, and this yeah. is the time to work. And uh, at the same time, like uh, when we build a team, like you already mentioned, we always looked into our network, mm -hmm. um, uh, people around us who were uh, hungry uh, or uh, eager to learn certain things. And from there on, uh, we started working with the HR department internally. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously based on our own connections mm -hmm. and our own wishes of like, okay, this is the colleague that I want to have at this position, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But it took a while before we had an HR team. Yeah, obviously. So first we, we built a management layer. Mm -hmm and uh, management of uh, some unexperienced, some experienced mm -hmm. people in all different departments. And we gave them the freedom to create their own team. Yeah. Cool. So they have the freedom to get interns, yeah. uh, keep certain interns, uh, offer contracts to uh, people that apply for a, a job. And uh, at the end of the day, obviously, we all have to sign the contracts. Yeah. But yeah, okay. it's all about like, uh, yeah, giving some freedom to your people mm -hmm. and also um, include them you know, into certain decision making. Yeah. So it's obviously it's the three of us, but it doesn't mean that we know it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, so you also learn from... Yeah, of course. Yeah. If you <laughs> the best thing that you should do as an entrepreneur is hire people that are better uh, in something than you are. Yeah. That's how you entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can have the ideas, you can know the, the vision or whatever. But you always have to have people around you that do things better than us. So in terms of, like, for example, operations or finance, mm -hmm. you know, or, or certain marketing activi activities or certain design activities or certain, you know, all, all different, uh, uh, um, yeah, aspects yeah. that we can't do all by, by ourselves. All by ourselves anymore. 
And I think that's a really good tip, especially for people, the people watching and listening that want to start their own thing. Definitely look for a team that knows it better than you because it can also become an ego thing, mm -hmm. but you can always learn from others. I think that's a really good tip. Mm -hmm. um, and also something that we can round up with. Um, you quickly said something about football. I know you love football and we are also going to do something together in Ghana together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably going to create my own uh, soccer team. Yeah, 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 your own football team. Yes. <laughs> my own football team yeah. in collaboration with Daily Paper in Ghana. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about New York and definitely us doing working together in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Um, Jefferson, I really want to thank you. What was that? It? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> we can talk for ages, right? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, yeah. talk for ages. No, but I really love this conversation. I feel like a lot of people that want to do something from the, for themselves or know you but haven't heard these things from you mm. before um, can really learn from this um, mm -hmm. episode. And it's good that you want to have more conversation because that means you guys need to follow Stories of Young Definitely daily paper if you're not. And then uh, in December, they will see more of us. Okay. Right? Yes. High five. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you guys enjoy this and um, see you guys in the next episode. Bye.